Hey guys, welcome back to a brand new video. I'm Daggett, this is Daggett Designs. In today's video, we are doing part two of our Grim Reaper design. So we're gonna be going through and shading, doing all of the black shading and all of the color so that we have a full finished painting. Now, if you already know you're gonna love today's video, make sure you smash that like button. And while you're down there, leave me a comment letting me know what you'd like to see next on my channel. That having been said, let's get straight into today's video by going to the overhead. Okay guys, welcome back to the table. So we're finishing off our Grim Reaper design. This is the design we started last week. We finished up all of the line work and we're gonna start painting it. If you haven't seen last week's video yet, I will leave a link in the description so that you can go ahead and watch that one and catch up to today's painting tutorial. So to start off with, I'll just go through our supplies. I'm gonna start off with just the black shading. So I've got a solid carbon black. This is carbon black uh, mixed with water to create a light gray wash and I've got carbon black mixed with water again to create a medium gray wash So obviously your ratios are going to be different and you'll need to experiment with that We are using Liquitex acrylic inks as always I've got two brushes that I'm starting with a number five and a number six These are synthetic Taclon brushes and I've also got a glass of water to wash my brushes out and to assist with blending So to start this one out, I'm going into my lightest gray wash and I'm gonna go through and do the clouds in the background. Now, anyone that follows me uh, with all of my videos would know that I like to do background work first. I just think it's a good way to help build up uh, enough contrast and it helps you sort of recognize how much uh, shadowing and shading you need to do in your foreground if you build up your background shades a little bit first. So I'm just gonna go through and do these background clouds. So essentially what I'm doing at this point is using my lightest gray wash to go through and paint in these clouds. And I'm just leaving a little white border around the each around each sort of section of the cloud. And as I come down into these spiral areas, I just bring that right around to the end, making sure to leave that little white gap all around the edge there. And this is gonna give them a nice clean look towards the end. But we're just starting off with our lightest gray wash to do these. All right, once you've done those background clouds with your gray wash, we can go ahead and start working on our main subject matter. Now you might be worried at this stage that your clouds look a little bit flat, and yes they do. We can go ahead and add some more layers to those and there'll be a little bit more shading in and around the background to help push things forward. But for now, I just wanna get a nice base coat on a lot of this uh, to sort of start to bring a few of the values through. And this will help with our shading later on. So I'm gonna start by working on this shoulder to give you guys an example of what we're doing. I'm going to go ahead and go in with my light grey wash again. And you don't really need to worry about being neat at this point because there's going to be some black shading over the top of a lot of this. But I'm pretty much just going to work uh, closely to my lines with my light grey wash here. And working around those areas. So what we're going to be doing is just creating a little bit of a soft edge uh, to some of these lines so that when we lay our grey shading over the top of it or our black wash shading it's uh, it'll just make it a little bit more of a smooth transition between the two. I'm gonna give you another example on this part here. So the inner section of your little J loop is going to be solid color like this. Now this one we're gonna bring up to this peak here, the highlight. So we'll come back down from there, just avoiding the black line that we've drawn there and then coming back up and around and that can just head down like that so as you can see we create this little loop of white or a little highlight around our J shape there and that's going to be really important later on you want to do that for these inside curves as well light gray on the innermost portion of the curve and then as it comes out just leaving that little strip of highlight along the very edge of that line and like I said this looks really sort of shitty at the moment but we do go ahead and add black over the top of a lot of this this just helps me get my gradients a bit smoother and get my values in the right places before I commit to any heavy black okay I'm sorry to interrupt your video guys but I know you're gonna want to hear about this this is the Hanya mask handbook I've just finished writing this brand new book and this is basically a book that will teach you guys how to draw a traditional Japanese style Hanya mask I've drawn diagrams and I've also written out a complete description on my process for how I go about drawing Japanese Hanya masks 
And guess what? The best part is this book is going to be absolutely free. There is a link in the description where you can download this one. So make sure you check that out today. Now, once you've done your gray wash shading over the entire cloak, we're gonna go ahead and start adding some black. This will help us determine some of the value and contrast in the piece before we start actually uh, painting in our skeletal figure and the scythe and the other details. So I'm gonna go in with my number five now and I'm going straight into my solid carbon black. Uh, the primary color for the outside of the cloak at least is going to be black. And you always wanna start in the place that you did first because that's gonna be the driest point. Uh, which, you know, if you're not blending through shades, then you want to start uh, at your dry area. So I'm going to come right up to the shoulder here, just leaving a little white gap. So when you get to one of your curves, basically what you're going to do is bring your black down the line there. And then follow your curve around. I like to leave a little bit of the grey wash visible if I can. This just gives me a little bit more room to work with my uh, shading. So just work that around your loop there or your fold, whatever you'd like to call it. And then you can take your blending brush and very, very gently feather out the edge of your shading. Or the edge of your black, I should say. Just feather that edge out to a bit of a gradient along your edges there. And then for that center section, you can go ahead and fill it in as solid black along the highlight side of it, like so. And then if you'd like to, you can go ahead and blend it towards the open end of that fold. So now I'm basically going through continuing with this particular method to get the folds in the fabric the way that I'd like them to be. So just going through and adding in black and I'm going to paint in the entire cloak using this same method. So you're just working over the top of your light grey wash and blending out those areas of shading to create a little bit of a transition between black and the edge or the border of some of your folds where the white highlight will sit. Now, once you've painted in all the areas or at least all of the black areas of your cloak, we're gonna go ahead and add a little bit of black shading to the areas that are going to be red, which is the inside portion of the cloak. So the first area of black shading for the red areas is gonna be on the inside of the cloak here. Now I'm just turning my page a little bit to make things easier. And then coming in with a little bit of my black at the edge there. And then I'll just feather that out and blend that through gray. And then blend that gray out. Now the only reason we do this is to add a bit of depth and shadow uh, before applying our red color over the top of it. This allows us to get a nice gradient in those areas. Now I'm gonna be doing this same thing for the inside portion of the sleeve at the bottom here. So you can see there's this first fold. I'm gonna apply a little bit of black to the inside of that first fold. And then blend it out a little bit with my blending brush. Now these areas of shadow are gonna be fairly minimal. I wanna show a nice bright area of red, so I'm not using too much black on the inside here just enough to create the folds on the inside of the fabric uh, appear natural and sort of realistic. So at this point, I'm gonna go in and start painting my skull. I'm just gonna flip my page around to get a better angle on the skull here. So I'm gonna come in with my black at first and just come in from the back of the mouth here with solid black. Just being very careful to work in between my teeth here. And then I'm gonna take my blending brush, put a little bit of water and just work that black forward into a gray and eventually into a very light gray in the open area of the mouth there. Now this isn't the most detailed way you can shade a mouth, certainly not, but I like 
a nice simple gradient on the inside of a skeleton mouth like this. I just think it looks nice. Now I'm also going to take a bit of black at the back base of the eye socket here. So just coming up and around like that. It's sort of a C shape. Feathering that out and blending around. And you want to blend in a circular motion to follow the actual contour of the eye socket there. Now it should result in a bit of a highlight spot towards the top there, which is what we want. Now on the inside of the base of the nose here, you can apply a bit of your black as well. And then just blend that up gently. And I will come from the back of the head here, just behind the hooded area. I'm going to bring some black up and across the head. I'm going to create a shadow from our hood. Just by feathering that out. And then very gently blending that across the front of the head. Now flipping my page back around, I'm just identifying some other areas of black. So I'd like to add a little bit of black in the edge of the cheek here. And again, just feathering that edge out to blend it out and fold. I'm gonna bring in a little bit of black from the front tooth here. And of course, blending that back across and sort of in between some of these teeth here. And at this point, you can always dip in with your blending brush into your light gray wash or your medium gray wash and just go through and start adding in some additional shadows uh, wherever you'd like them to sit. So maybe at the back of the jaw here. You don't quite want it to be uh, too harsh at the back there. Might just come in with a medium gray wash and then I can gently blend that forward to get my different gradients of gray. Now another thing you might like to do is take a little bit of your black and just come in off that very front corner of the eye and just gently blend that back and around. Now for painting in the hand, I'm just taking my light gray wash and going along the edges of the bones, leaving little streaks of white across some of these edges just to create little highlights along them. And like I've said when uh, just sketching this one in, it's not super, super anatomically accurate. Uh, you know, it does have a little bit of accuracy, but you know, shading this in, I like to keep it nice and simple. So just a little bit of our light gray wash and leaving some streaks of white along some of these edges just to create some highlight spots. And then you can go ahead in with your medium or darker gray and create a secondary sort of shadow along some of these areas. And you wanna be a little bit more careful with this gray, just not to overdo it. With a light gray, it's very easy to sort of add as much as you want without ruining it but as you go in with a, a darker gray or even a black, you've got to be really careful how much you're actually adding. Now from here, I'm just going to do a bit of gray wash shading on our scythe here. I'm going to turn it around and I'm going to take my light gray wash and work on this inner curve. This is the bladed portion of the scythe. So I'm going to come across it with our gray wash. And every now and then I'll stop the gray wash, leave a little line and then maybe start it again. And then off that area that I started again, I might blend that forward to its lightest point and then start another solid line. So as you guys can see, what that technique does is gives it a little bit of a uh, glimmery finish. It adds highlight streaks through it and makes it look like a polished blade. You can of course add some darker tones in there if you'd like to. Okay, from here I'm taking some of my solid carbon black coming in off the back of the scythe at the top here. Bringing it forward probably about halfway like that. I'll get some water on my blending brush. 
feather that edge out and then I'll just slowly work that out to a medium sort of grey re-dipping my brush as necessary and then working that medium grey through to a light and eventually just to the paper now as for doing the scythe handle uh, for the wood grain I'm going to be working with a medium grey wash and just working in between some of my textures so this means just working alongside some of those lines uh, to create a little bit of a shadow underneath them this is exactly the same method that I've used in previous videos to do Hanya mask horns so if you've watched any of my previous videos you should already know or have a rough idea on how to do this but you're basically creating that wood grain texture just by adding a bit of shadow next to some of your wood grains okay once you've done your scythe and the rest of your black and gray shading here there's a little bit more black shading to do uh, first up it will be in the leaves of our flowers here so i'm going to keep this one nice and simple there's so many different ways to shade and paint leaves but i like to sort of keep it a little bit simple uh, for these videos so yeah i'm going to keep this one nice and simple go in with solid black from the very end of my leaf like this and i'm always going to be following the shape of my leaf when i do this so always rounding out my black shading as i come down and once i've just done the end of the leaf like that i'll take my blending brush I'll feather that out and I'll just gradually blend that back in a circular motion towards the base portion of that part of the leaf till it blends out to a light, nice, uh, nice light grey. I'll come up with this next little section again with a bit of black towards the end here, always following the shape of my leaf. And then coming in with the blending brush and in a circular motion blending that back towards the base of the leaf here now if you've studied any form of art before you'll know that this probably isn't very realistic way of shading because we're not following any light source here it's just a stylized way of shading our leaves here and you'll find that with a lot of tattoo designs you know like the main subject matter might be shaded uh, with a lot of attention towards the light source but sometimes your background elements won't be and this is for uh, artistic and stylistic preference and that you know is pretty important with tattoo design so I like to do the ends of these leaves solid black and blend them backwards but like I said there's so many different ways to do them I've done them in many different ways before just have a look at some reference pictures and see how you'd like to shade your leaves this is just one way to do it now the last thing you can do with your black shading here is some fill in shadows you don't have to do this it's certainly not 100% necessary but I like to sort of do it where there's areas I want to bulk out without actually putting any subject matter in them so just behind this peony at the base here it's looking a little bit thin and not really there's not really much going on so I'll just add a bit of black and then blend that out now, as you blend that out it almost becomes just a little shadow or maybe a bit of smoky fog in the background and that's a really nice way to fill out little gap areas like this in a neo-traditional half sleeve design such as this one okay so we're moving over to colors now i've washed my palette and my brushes out and i've reset my palette so i've got sap green mixed with yellow orange azo i've got plain yellow orange azo here this is vivid red orange which is going to be used uh, with the yellow orange azo to do our chrysanthemum flowers i have transparent raw ermba for the handle of the scythe and pyrol red which we're using for the inside of his cloak i've also refilled my wash cup now generally speaking when i paint tattoo flash i like to work uh, in a light to dark sequence so i'm going to start off with our leaves and our sap green here so what i'm going to do is mix our sap green up that's a mix of sap green and yellow orange azo and i'll load my brush up pretty heavily and i'll come in straight over the top of the black shading we did towards the end of my leaf there and i'm going to bring that back down and you want to load this up quite heavily on the page i'll bring that back down to about halfway start to follow the curvature of the leaf a little bit and then with my blending brush, I can start to blend that back towards center. 
and get it to a nice light green tone towards that center portion. We'll come up to the next part of the leaf using that same method. Getting a darker green for that portion and blending it through and around just using some water towards the center. Now the most challenging part of this will be getting your blends between the separate portions of the leaf consistent and that's just going to take a bit of practice and a bit of work and you'll have to work relatively quickly uh, in this section to get them to blend together nicely. So following the shape of my leaf, again blending it through to the other leaf sections and down to white at the base of the leaf. And the same thing will apply for this last section of our leaf. Bring that green around. I'll turn my page for this part just to make my life a bit easier. And I'll blend that around, get it to a nice white uh, highlight area at the base and blend that through. So that's basically the technique I'm going to use to uh, shade my leaves uh, with our green there. And I'm gonna use that for these ones as well. Now I've done all of the sap green, so we've got most of the dark tones in. Before we go into some bright colors, I'm just gonna take my transparent raw umber and go straight over the top of my scythe here. Now when you're doing this, you don't have to worry uh, too much about adding highlights or blending. The really nice thing about these transparent colors is that they go uh, really, really smoothly over the top of your gray wash shading. And you don't really have to worry about adding any more values to them if you've done your gray wash shading correctly underneath them. But either way, I'd like to keep this area a little bit more simple uh, for my brown tone here. You can of course add more detail and shading if you'd like. It depends how big that part of the design is. If that sort of section or that element of the design is a focal point, yes, you wanna add more shading to it, add more detail and blending to it. If it's not really a focal point, it's just a sort of byproduct of the rest of the design, uh, then you don't really need to add as much shading and attention to it. You can sort of gloss over it a little bit, keep it a little bit more simple and let the other areas of the design stand out. So in this case, I'm gonna keep the scythe a little bit more simple and let the other areas of the design pop. Okay, I wanna come in and start painting the chrysanthemums. Now I've done chrysanthemum tutorials before, so I'm only gonna give you guys a quick look at how I paint these and then I'll go through and finish the rest off. So I'm gonna start with my vivid red orange at the base and then blend forward into my yellow orange azo. So at the base of each petal, you can start with a bit of your vivid red orange and then blend that up towards the tip section of your petal making sure you reach a nice light color if not white by the end of that petal so that your yellow color can really show through but the base of each petal is going to be your darker tone as this is the sort of darkest point of each petal this is where the shadow area will be coming from the base of the flower so go through and add in your base tone using your vivid red orange Now, once I've done all of my shadow tones using that vivid red orange, I can just lay up my yellow orange azo pretty much straight over the top of all of the petals. And you'll get this really nice fade transition, almost like a sunset color between the yellow orange azo and the vivid red orange. So this is what's gonna help give the chrysanthemum shape and give it that sort of bulbous ball shape that we have there because the orange is gonna create the shadow areas of the flower and help keep it round uh, in appearance. So I'm doing the inside and the outside of this chrysanthemum yellow. So having those shadow tones on there is really important. And if you take your time doing that, then you can pretty much layer your yellow straight over the top of all of your petals. And you don't need to worry about uh, blending or shading any of your light tones. If you'd like to, of course you can, and you can go ahead and add much more detail to this. Uh, but just for this example, I'm just showing you how simple it can really be to blend straight over the top of your shadow tones and still get a really nice appearance without going through and painting each individual petal uh, like we've done in previous videos. This is going to be a much faster way of doing it. It is a lazy approach and it, you know the results will vary. It's not gonna look 
uh, nearly as nice as individually hand painting each petal. But for a simple approach, you can just do a color wash straight over the top as long as you have that shading underneath it to still help give it volume and shape. All right, now once you've painted in both of your chrysanthemums, there is one thing left to do and that is to paint the red for the inside of your robe. This is gonna be super simple. We're going in with pyrrole red and there's not really gonna to be too much blending or shading here uh, unless you'd like to do so. But I'm pretty much just going straight over the top of any black shading or gray shading that I've done. And I'm gonna be very careful to leave a little white gap along pretty much any areas that I don't want to be solid, solid red, you know, right to the edge. Uh, for these little torn areas of fabric, I'll just bring that red right up to the edge of the fabric. There's nothing behind it that is overly detailed or that needs to be given much breathing space. You know, the clouds behind this red are a nice light gray color. So I can bring that red right to the edge uh, without worrying that I'm, you know, overshadowing any of the details on the design. For the inner portion at the neck here, there is gonna be a little bit of shading. I'll come straight in over the top of the black and gray shading that we did. And I'll bring that red probably to three quarters of the way up. And just as I reach that very edge part there, I'll just get my blending brush and gently blend that out and across to white, just to fade that off towards the edge there. So I'm just working in between these little, I guess, rib bones and blending towards the edge there. Now there's the areas that we've got the little shadows from the fold over. So I'm gonna bring the red out from those little shadows like so. And then just as we approach that next line, I just feather that red off ever so slightly to give it a softer appearance. And that's pretty much how you're gonna tackle these little shadowed areas. Uh, for this one, we can bring that right down to the leaf. So we've got another little shadow area. So I'll bring my red out like this. And as I sort of approach the next section, I'll just feather that edge to soften it. This is to help give it a little bit more of a flowy fabric appearance and just make it look a little less rigid. Now at this point, if you wanted to, you could turn that into a little swooped curve the same way that we do on the outside of the cloak. So you can also play around with adding extra details in with your shading and coloring, like little extra textures that maybe you didn't think of while you were doing the line work. And there's certainly nothing wrong with doing that as long as you're careful. So coming up to my next line, I'm just softening it. And then for this very last one, we're going out over the top of our black shading. This is heading down towards the very base of our design. As I reach the bottom of the design, there's just a little bit that gets faded off at the very end here, and that just fades off to white. And then as we approach that edge, I just wanna soften that out the same way that we have been, just soften that uh, color out. This is gonna give us a tiny little highlight streak across that edge that shows where the fabric's actually rolled back on itself. Now that is our near traditional Grim Reaper half sleeve design finished. I really, really hope you guys enjoyed this one and I hope you give it a go, it was a lot of fun. Like I said, if you haven't seen the line work section of this, there'll be a link in the description where you can find that. But if you've already done your line work, I really hope you enjoy painting this one and I'll see you guys in the next video. All right, bye-bye. If you like the content that I make and you'd like to support the channel, make sure you smash that like button. And hey, while you're at it, check out one of these other great videos.